Hello everyone, I'm Graham Park and welcome to another Creative Future session where I talk to a variety of creators from across the creative sector in front of an online audience of students from Glyndur University. In this session, I'll be talking to the co-founder and creative director of Edit Brand Studio, a design and branding studio dedicated to creating, evolving and transforming brands. Please welcome Karen Hughes. Hello, Karen. Hi, I'm Graham. You okay? Yes, thank you very much for joining us. I hope I got all all that right. Yes, uh, yes, better than I do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's start off. Um, you've got a um, a little show reel that you sent me. So <laughs> let me just share our screen here, and hopefully, well, I've lost it now. It's here on my desktop. <laughs> Here's your little show reel. There we go. Um, do you feel, how do you feel when you see that? Because that's, you know, your work, isn't it? Um, it's good. It's so out of date now. So all I'm thinking is, oh, gosh, we've got so much more work to put in there. But no, it's really good because um, we're only four years old now. So that's quite a lot of work in that time. So, yeah, pretty proud, really. Um, so you describe yourself as a multidisciplinary designer and a passionate advocate for the power of creativity now that's exactly why we've got you here and, and what the creative future program is all about but before we go into more detail because obviously that um showreel showed the diversity of, of of clients you have but before we go into that how did you get to where you are today tell us about your journey to the here and now yeah so i guess um in terms of background, I never really set out to be a designer, so I wasn't someone that was really clear on a career path as such. So, you know, when I was at kind of college, I wasn't really sure on kind of a direction for a career. I was quite, I was, I was probably better at academic subjects, if I'm honest, like science, maths, history, that sort of thing, where you could learn it and kind of pass an exam but it wasn't something that excited me whereas the, the art and the design subjects although maybe they weren't my strength at the time they excited me the most so I kind of knew I wanted a career in something I could enjoy rather than just you know pay the bills so that took me down a, a broad art and design path um, I went to um, college and did an art foundation course where you could try lots of different art and design subjects like ceramics, textiles, photography, that sort of thing. Um, and that's kind of when I sort of stumbled across what graphic design was um, as, as kind of really not just about logos and identity, but it was about solving problems for people with design. So that's the bit that really interested me, less about the craft and more about the creative thinking. So um, it was all about kind of getting a brief and solving that brief for the client there was kind of a challenge and a puzzle in it so that was the kind of thing that started to direct me down this path um I was particularly like I said interested in the ideas side of things so when I went to university I chose um to go to University of Central Lancashire in Preston and they have a really good creative thinking course so it is a called graphic design but the focus is very much on ideas creativity, problem solving, and the craft of design was taught, but it wasn't a focus. Um, so that's kind of where I ended up in the area of graphic design. But as you said, I'm a multidisciplinary designer because graphic design, it's just, you know, it's, it's 
it's really doesn't sum up what I do at all. Um, we work in everything now from digital design, environmental design, interior design, etc. Design is such a broad subject um, that graphic design feels far too narrow for me and I don't really call myself a graphic designer anymore. Um, but that's how I got into that route anyway. You, you said that you did a kind of kind of science um, at, um, before you discovered art and design. Um, are there any like is there anything because because you do so many things uh, is there anything you learn from that science background any transferable skills that you've applied to the art and design I'm always um, fascinated by people who change track yeah um I guess well the thing with kind of what we do at edit is we have quite a lot of very broad clients so we work on everything from zoos to we're rebranding a institute in at the Cambridge University a biomedical institute so all of that kind of knowledge of different subjects so a broad knowledge base has really really helped um I guess I'm quite logical in my approach to design as well because design it can be quite an emotive creative thing but I'm quite um interested in the strategic and the logical side of things as well so I guess that's that's where that can kind of cross over um right so your ex brand experience spans a range of sectors arts culture and heritage visitor attractions financial services technology and innovation health and life sciences and, and, and loads more as well how do you approach um clients from different sectors so for example do um, clients from the creative sector require a different approach to maybe a financial company or a very corporate company? Yeah, I mean, we probably tailor our approach to different types of clients. So we probably do sort of tailor how we go about things. But the process, to be honest, is always exactly the same. Um, so it's always, you know, clients don't we don't go into clients pretending to be experts in their world so we don't we don't say we're specialists in financial services or zoos or museums and galleries because when you go up against people that are actually experts in that you're just going to fall down so we just go in we're experts in brand and design and we sort of take each client as they come really they all have a challenge or a problem to solve so we work with them really to identify what that problem is um, and bring our brand expertise rather than any sort of sector conventions so i suppose getting to know uh, the client is probably a very good idea so obviously there's a lot of research when someone approaches you you presumably go and research the company yeah yeah completely i think there's a lot of the answers are always in the research or the conversations that you have with clients so our approach will always be obviously doing our own research but we talk a lot to people we we kind of um there's there's a kind of perception of branding agencies is kind of a lot of branding jargon and going in and talking a lot we don't tend to do that we tend to kind of listen and find out what the client looks for so a lot comes out of that initial you know a couple of weeks research and talking to clients and things like that because the answer's often in those bits it's just digging around to find it <laughs> what about uh, though see i've got a big client from the financial sector do you go and look out look at their competition and see what they're doing. And if you come across another, say, say a competitor that's doing something amazing, do you take something for that? Or you do, do you deliberately say, right, we've got to do something completely different? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. So yeah, if you are working for a client in a particular sector, you need to know the competition, you need to know what's going on out there. And I think often what, what we'll do at the start of a project is, is kind of find out where our client needs to position themselves because there's all sorts of brands so you could be a brand that wants to deliberately challenge convention and be different and in which case no you don't want to follow what everyone else is doing and you want to be the innovative ones with the new ideas but sometimes it's absolutely okay to blend in and you want to be trusted and and that sort of thing and in which case you'd never take ideas at all from from kind of anyone else but you probably do want to be following the convention a bit more in that case and there's also the case with, with banks i would imagine banks don't want to be too radical do they yeah well you say that we we actually have um a client um 
a big investment company. So obviously that's that's people's life savings there and you, you don't want to be too kind of frivolous. But actually some of the work we're doing with them is the most exciting work that, that we're doing at the moment. And they, they are, you know, looking for ways to shake up the industry. They're realizing that investing is quite intimidating for some people. So they're looking at really creative, innovative ways of making investing more accessible. So yeah it's it's sometimes it's, sometimes it's really unexpected you can go in with a perception of what an industry's like and, and you know everyone's been doing it a certain way for so long it's our job to think actually is there a better way of doing it so that's where that problem solving comes in yeah that's that's a good point actually, i'm thinking of, when you said that i immediately thought of a company called money box that kind of uh, yeah yeah do, exactly. do that that similar sort of thing so creative thinking idea generation, copywriting, brand communication, design projects, identities, campaigns. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> wait, wait, these are so many, although it's under your big kind of umbrella, it's so many different niche parts of it. Where do you, do you get your inspiration from? Um, I, what I always say to my designers and what I try not to do is look too much at what other design agencies are doing for inspiration. It's really great to kind of use it as motivation and think, oh, they're doing something really good. It's really important to know what's going on in the industry. But I think it's really important not to take that and follow trends for, for no reason. So we're really cautious that the inspiration doesn't come from there. I just get really inspired by the clients and what they're trying to achieve. We're, we're quite lucky in a way because we we have a lot of clients that have a real sense of purpose. So as you said, in arts and culture sector, you know, it's not necessarily about making money. Obviously they need to, to, to survive, but it's, it's much more of a kind of purpose-driven organizations to kind of share arts and culture with people. So I get motivated by the kind of impact that design can have really. No, I, I, I personally think that's great advice. Be aware of the competition, but do but, but always do your own thing, yeah. Um, now, I've got, I've got a couple of questions have come in while I've been saying all that. Um, uh, Leon, Leon Wood wants to ask, right, um, if you've any advice for up-and-coming designers, and have you got any jobs going? Come on, that Leon, you're a student, aren't you? No, um, have you got any jobs going, he says. But no, what, what advice would you <laughs> up and coming designers so someone who's starting out in this in this sector yeah um oh, i've got so much advice but i guess i think the, i can only talk about the things that have really benefited me and i think it's been really open to opportunities i think a lot of people think opportunities come with these big flashing signs and, and you know there's going to be one big opportunity and the the opportunity to just land it's not it's about small opportunities like it's about going to events and meeting people mm. and you never know when you meet one person it might not you know nothing might come of it for a year but they might have a connection so i think it's finding and making your own opportunities and and they don't just come through to traditional ways of applying for a job i think you want to be in that industry you know net i hate the word networking I'm, I'm allergic to networking but being in there enjoying it being part of the industry and those opportunities then just happen someone will recommend you you'll hear of something like that so definitely like looking getting better at making your own opportunities and spotting what an opportunity is. Um, that would be definitely what's benefited me, just turning up at things and having a conversation that's randomly led to something. But uh, with, the, with the pandemic though, in the background, how's, how's that affected the opportunity to actually do that, to go and randomly meet people at swanky exhibitions or at or at corporate events how have you adapted to the pandemic yeah. apart from apart from zoom obviously yeah i think well to be honest it is there's like so many events on zoom but it is so much more difficult <laughs> there's no getting around that it is just a lot more difficult at the minute but it you know it's not forever i think um I think another way really is to get your work out there and noticed and things like that. So there's a lot of um, the, the kind of reason I'm here today is my connection to DNAD, which is a kind of an awards body for design. It's quite well known and that being involved in that 
from a student. I won um, a kind of student new blood award for DNAD and that's like been a springboard for me. So getting your work noticed and out there with with kind of bigger organizations that have a bigger reach is, is really good as well, which which isn't anything you can't do during a pandemic and and so that that's where I'd focus my time at the moment. So 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 would you like would, would social media be a good way of, of, of doing that? Yeah, hundred percent. I think um I'm not I can't say I'm great at social media myself. So I feel I feel bad for lecturing other people. But yeah, hundred percent, you know, sharing your work on social media. But I think you're only gonna have your reach in that. So it's being able to tap into kind of other other places that have a wider reach, like awards, if you enter student awards, for example, or it doesn't just have to be awards, it could be a, a brief, you know, a charity brief or something, getting your work out there and getting it noticed, I think is really important. And yes, social media, but don't look at look at edits, social media, we haven't updated it for a while, but okay. yeah, we, should, we should do. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's about who you connect with though, isn't it? I mean, yeah, you, yeah. you should follow people that you admire. I mean, for example, people should follow you you if, if this is the area yeah follow us yeah <laughs> um here's another question uh from david merrilee's kelly he says that he absolutely loves your work for aj bell how was this pitched and how hard were they to convince yeah so i think the the project referring to it was um as, this is a good example where we're talking about AJ Bell are an investment company, so you'd think they would want to play it safe. But this particular campaign, um, it was it was there on the risky side. It was kind of using a lot of swear words and things like that. But um, yeah, they, do you know what? They pushed us to do that. So we were on the cautious side and them as a client, they didn't need persuading. They, they were the ones pushing us to say, look, we want to do something different. We want to get noticed. We're willing to kind of um, push things and be a bit braver. So that one actually didn't take a lot of persuading. They had to persuade us in a way because we were all, oh, you can't do that. You might get in trouble for this. So in a way, that was a dream client pushing pushing us. But some clients do need to be taken on a journey if, if there's a sense of bravery or challenging convention. Yeah, you have to take them on that journey. Yeah, no, no that's it. I was going to ask you about that. Two scenarios. So you got like a big client will come to you and they'll say, this is what we want to do. You really want the client, but you think, oh my God, this is the most rubbish idea I've ever heard. How, how, do, you, how do you deal with that? But also the, the flip side of that coin, a company comes to you um, with an amazing idea that you think so amazing. How do you make it better? Yeah, um, so the first, you know, if someone comes to you with something and it's a terrible idea, you kind of, shoot yourself in the foot if you don't say mm. anything so we won't just kind of take things f for money and just to get it done because you've got to put your name to it and and I just feel like things like that come back to haunt you a long time ago so I think you just really have to take a step back look at what the client's objectives are and find some logic and reason to sort of talk them around rather than oh that's like terrible idea you need to sort of back it up by why it won't work so I think having knowledge of in, in my in my kind of industry marketing and audiences and have proof of why things don't work mm -hmm. that's the best way to deal with with that and remind me sorry the second well, scenario. Before, before the second part so you have to be diplomatic if someone's got a, what an idea that they love but you think it's rubbish you're just saying be diplomatic and can you can you actually change a, a client's mind? Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. You do have to take them on that journey. Often we find so at the meeting I have to leave at two o'clock. We we're working with a client and they've created their own logo themselves. The the, the owner of the business created it. He's obviously very attached to it and mm -hmm. and it's fine and it's okay. But what we've done is we've taken them on a journey, shown them what that can be, and then showed them other possibilities and and the scope and the breadth of other possibilities so I think you have to be quite other people have different ways my way is to be quite diplomatic it's their decision it's their business but if we show them their options and pros and cons of each you know hopefully we can get them to move on something a bit better but yeah you have to be really diplomatic <laughs> but, if, but, but if you can't get them to change their mind would, would you walk away from um, 
or have you walked walked away from anything? Do you know? I've never really, honestly, been in that situation. To be honest, um, yeah, we'd. I guess we'd have to in a way because you you you've got do, your reputation, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. You've got your reputation, and um, yeah, like I said, things come back to haunt you. They don't get <laughs> buried. They're out in the real world, and and there's a lot of um, as with any industry, there's a lot of kind of design critique websites and things there's nowhere to hide if you if your work isn't up to scratch it's it's kind of a a very tricky area so and I don't mind that no one's gonna love your work all the time at all but as long as you believe in it that's that's the difference so if you put something out there you don't believe in then you can't really defend it can you no but you know you're right crit critiques that, that's true of any industry now everyone is a yeah. critic aren't they about, <laughs> about everything and and the other scenario was if a if a client comes to you and their idea is fantastic and you think do you, and you think oh my god this is great do you how do you get away with saying it's great but because because you want to get paid you know, could, could, I mean can, what I'm trying to say is can you like take their idea and make it better or take their idea and sell it back to them and charge them you know what yeah, I mean? I think, um, you think this is great. What yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, um, clients, they do come often with their own ideas. And yes, sometimes it's quite a clear idea, but they've come to us for a reason to kind of run with it. Maybe they've had this great idea, but they, they don't know how to apply it mm. across multiple kind of channels and things. So I guess that's where we'd come into it to take that great idea and amplify it and share it with other people across different channels um so i'd say that's where we'd come in in that situation um, um what about trends i mean um do clients ever come to you and say you know for example I, i've noticed in the past few years lots of adverts with um animated um toys or animated furry animals right yeah, yeah. Do, do, i mean is that a trend do people come to you and go i want one of those campaigns with a with an animated furry animal singing a to, along to a daft song how, how do you... <laughs> um no we don't tend to kind of we don't really have that many sort of commercial clients so oh. i think that would be you know i definitely think that happens but um trends are tricky trends are really tricky because the they do a job in a way they make you feel current and relevant at a period of time but also you don't want to just follow trends for no reason mm -hmm. everything has to be done for a reason so if there's a reason to follow the trend because you're trying to attract a specific audience right here right now and that's what is going to grab them then yeah follow the trends but if it's following it for trend's sake then definitely not um joanna atkinson would like to ask um is there a formula for a successful brand allowing you to work with a whole range of sectors? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, we have a very sort of consistent, specific process, and it's really, really kind of simple. It's just about kind of investigating and researching things. Then there's the kind of ideas stage and then there's the implementation stage you know it's that simple there's not much else to it but I think in terms of the formula for brands it's always about I always think people think of brands as logos and colors and things like that and in a certain to a certain extent it is but brands are so much more than that I you know if you think of Apple mm -hmm. Apple isn't the logo, Apple is the products, it's the shops, it's the way someone answers the phone to you, it's the people. A brand is so much more than that. And that has to start with what the brand is about. So the purpose of that brand, why that brand exists. And I think, so we always start at the center, like what, what, what is it that you're, that makes you different? What are you here for? So that, or, no matter whether that's a zoo or an art gallery finding what the purpose of that brand is and what you're selling in a way where even if you're not selling something everybody's selling something even if it's not a product so it's really getting to that core of what the brand is about and then everything else once you know that sort of follows that so you you create a logo that brings that to life you choose a color palette that brings that to life you create a campaign that captures what you're trying to say so if you've got that core bit at the beginning the real idea at the heart of the business or the organization 
everything else follows. Yeah, I, it's funny. I was I was actually going to ask you this because I because you said to me last night on the phone um, about it's not just about the logo; it's about everything else. And you you just you just covered that. But that really struck me when you said that last night. Yeah. Um, here's one from Daniel Birchall. His question is: um, How often do you receive a messy end brief from a client, and how would you approach from the start? Um. Yeah, often client briefs are, aren't brief at all. They are not even, you know, 10 pages. They're 30, 40 page documents with research, oh. things like that. And we often have to, you don't just get given a brief very often, very, it's not very often, sorry, that you get given a brief straight away. You often have to do a tender or a proposal. So there's an awful lot of work in taking a brief, figuring out what you're going to do. But the way we always approach it is to strip things back and try and like put all the kind of messy bits that maybe are, are, are important, but not particularly relevant and find that real problem that they're trying to solve, like that one line. And we try and always distill it down to a one line problem in the end. So it's definitely about stripping things back, editing down and trying to find that one key thing that they're actually trying to do. Um, which isn't easy, it takes a lot of work, but I would say, yes, yeah, stripping back and trying to find out what they really mean. <laughs> it's, it's quite tricky though. Um, Alan Humphreys uh, has got a question that um, he says, can you ask Karen what she thinks makes a good designer? It's quite a general one, but then he says, what are your, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, so in a, desi in a good designer, I think, if you're a designer, there's a certain level of skill that you need. And I think that's a, a given. You need to have the tools to be able to do what you do. And I think if you're in university and you come out the other side, you know, you should have those, those skills. So what we actually look for really is attitude. I think for, for us at Edit, attitude, a good attitude is everything. If you're keen and you're willing to learn, we're not expecting you to be the finished article. We're expecting kind of you to help us out, make our life easier. And in, and in return, hopefully you'll learn and, and get better. So it's definitely for us at Edit anyway, about a really good attitude. We have a really good team of people. Um, from all sorts of kind of ages and backgrounds and things like that but we all we all kind of have a shared respect and attitude we all muck in together and I think if you weren't prepared to kind of you know do the hard work do some of the late nights that's inevitable in the creative industry then then you're going to kind of let the team down you're going to kind of show so it's definitely attitude is everything to us um, and in terms of my, is it my strengths and values or the yeah, strengths? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah, let's see your, your strengths and weaknesses. I think strengths is definitely where, where I can hold my own against kind of other designers is definitely on the ideas and the creative thinking side of things and all of the logic that goes in behind that. So I think it's there's some designers, very, very good designers, much better designers than me out there with craft and skills and things like that. But my personal strengths are in the ideas and the creative thinking side. I also think another strength is, of, of mine is I don't, I'll push myself out of my comfort zone. So we will take on things that we've never done before. You know, clients come to us for, with briefs that we've never done before. And we'll be honest and we'll be open and we'll say, we haven't done this before, but we'll absolutely, you know, help you do it. And there's a, a sense of like discomfort that comes with that. But I think that's where where the, the growth comes really. So I think that's another strength. I'm, I'm happy, you know, feeling uncomfortable sometimes. And I think that's a really good lesson for everyone really that you do have to push yourself sometimes. And, and that's something I've just got used to in my career, I think. So, so you, you mentioned your team there a few times. Um, when, you, when you get a, a client or when, when a tender comes up, um, do you got other different people you go to in your team for different things or is it the same kind of group of people all the time? Yeah, well, we're quite a small team. Um, so 
permanent members of the team, there's six of us, but what we do have is a really wide bank of kind of freelance, you know, partners that we use. So we, yeah, we definitely tailor the people for the right jobs. And we have a core team that pretty much, you know, run all the projects, but we don't, you can't, you know, you listed out all those skills before. You can't be really good at everything. You need to be able to know people that are good at things and use them. So we're very kind of set up collaboratively. We, we're quite small, we're based in Manchester, but we, we win big projects for big London galleries and things like that. And that's because of the network we've got and the collaborators that we work with. It's, it's definitely not, you know, just us doing the same thing all the time would be pretty boring as well i'm glad i'm glad you said collaborative work there on more, uh, more than once because it's something i always get across to my students is collaboration in the creative industries is is key and you've yeah. just back you just back that up yeah. uh, working with people from different um disciplines under one umbrella yeah. um going back to tenders um you hear about a tender i mean how 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 much time and effort and money do you spend on a tender that that's, and there's no guarantee it's going to um, get picked up? Lots and lots and lots of time. It's myself and my um, business partner, Khadija, um, we just, to be honest, that's our evenings and weekends. We have day jobs to do. So that's the stuff, unfortunately, we're a small business. So that's the stuff that is done at the weekend. So in terms of time, it takes a lot. In terms of money, it doesn't cost us anything because it's our time it just costs us our kind of spare time really um but it is a very lengthy process tenders um we we we're very selective on the ones we'll go to so we wouldn't do things if it was kind of quite a cold tender and we didn't have a relationship already because it doesn't tend to work there's always some sort of connection or relationship there so we, we'll go for the ones we think we can win it and we do quite well so but we lose some as well. It's just the name of the game. Alan's got another question, actually, which is quite appropriate to what you just said. He says, do you find there's still a north-south divide when it comes to getting the larger accounts? Yeah, I think um, defi there definitely is, and there is a bit of kind of, for want of a better word, a bit of snobbery sometimes in terms of London and Manchester design. But we from our kind of experience and the clients we've built it's not been a problem for us so to be honest 80 percent of our clients are in london um and that that's just they they've got to know us they like us and they recommend us to other kind of similar organizations so it's not personally for us but there definitely is a divide um and it's you know it's un, it's unfortunately it's un, unnecessary but there are some you know i think it's changing to be honest i think this whole pandemic has changed things hugely as well because you know no one's meeting in person so you know you could be in manchester scotland you know mexico wherever you know you can we're working with a illustrator in peru at the moment you know distance is a relative i'm not going to brush over it there is there is definitely you know people that want a london agency because of the prestige it brings they have swanky offices our office is not swanky at all but but there's hey, a bit what, of that left <laughs> what do they know what are yeah, they exactly. um, but our, our clients don't care and you know um in no in normal sense outside the pandemic do you how much time do you spend visiting clients i mean how many how many um, hours on trains do you spend so many hours we would be on the train to London you know once or twice a week waiting for the cheap fare home at half seven you know we cool. spend a lot of time at Nando's in Euston you know that <laughs> that was our life so the pandemic obviously lots of negatives but that's one positive I think mm. our clients are much more used to us working over Zoom now um I do miss bring that up and Will that have a knock-on effect though? When we get back to normal, do you think you'll do more online meetings? Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, you know, you know, trains come with a cost, and often that's passed on to clients and things. So from that perspective, I think in terms of like creative presentations, it's very hard over Zoom. Like we've got one, you know, at two o'clock, and it's really hard. You want it on the walls. You want people to be interacting with it. So. I don't think we'd switch to Zoom for that, but just meetings that we were going down for that are just an hour to get everyone in the same room. I think that 
that's definitely on Zoom now. Mm. Um, what, what's is what's it like? Um, you have like been a woman in an industry that maybe traditionally was more male dominated. I mean, you must have seen some changes in your seventeen years. Yeah, I think to be honest, when I started, I was kind of quite naive and it wasn't something on my radar at all and my first job my creative director was a female so oh. my experience hasn't been that but the kind of more I've kind of moved up within the industry I've realized kind of how underrepresented kind of females and, and you know the other things in the industry you know it's really hard if other designers can't see people like them in in those higher kind of I'm not saying higher up but those kind of bigger roles those more leadership roles so it's something that hasn't been an issue for me it's certainly not held me back the places I've worked it's not been an issue but obviously it isn't it is an issue that you know myself and there's very few female owned design agencies and we didn't set up for that reason but now we're in that we kind of embrace it a bit and try and kind of has, has, that ever, like that. has that ever worked to your advantage? Have any clients chosen you because it, you're, you're female owned? Um, I don't think they'd ever say that, but I do think a lot of our clients, you know, they have to they have to consider diversity and inclusion and things. We have, you know, a lot of clients, um, it's like the National Lottery Heritage Fund, National Portrait Gallery, it's their mission to be more inclusive and diverse. Mm. So I'm sure it's a benefit. I don't think, you know, obviously, hopefully it's our work that wins, but I think it's a positive. And, and my business partner, Khadija, she's from Kenya. She's not born in the UK and she's moved over here. So we, we do offer like a broader, mm. you know, view of things, which I think is important. So yeah, I, I think it's a complete positive, yeah. Um, right, John Robinson wants to ask you, uh, do you ever have a creative block? And if so, have you got any strategies for dealing with that? Yes, 100% all the time. I I think the, the challenge with picking a creative career is, the positive is obviously you get to do something you love. The negative is it doesn't work in a nine to five kind of time frame. So, you know, if, if I sit down I have to be creative in a certain time it often doesn't happen it's just more when I free myself up I, I walk away if I, if I can't do something I, I like to go for a run kind of switch my switch my brain in a different way so exercise forgetting about things I've really missed the train journey actually which is really strange but often like that's where I'd have my ideas after a day in the office discussing things, researching. It all just kind of clicks together once you stop thinking. I think sometimes you can try too hard to have an idea and you kind of have just step away and and let your brain do its do its stuff. I, I'm a strong believer in kind of ideas and the the connections in your brain and the science behind having an idea. And a lot of that is building connections and then letting those form so yes yeah, step away exercise don't put yourself under too much pressure is, no. is how i deal with it. anyway yeah me too exercise is great just take a just take a couple of hours away for a walk or a bike ride or something um craig garside wants to ask what kind of things do you look for in a portfolio just finals or process too um well that's a hard that's a hard one actually I think I, I'm a believer that if you have to over explain your idea and how you got there then it's it's maybe not as strong as it needs to be so I'm quite into I'd like to see what the brief was a very short introduction to what the brief was a bit of maybe background into your idea but almost the idea and the process that you've been through should come through in your work in a way. So I often, um, I go, I sometimes go back to my old university and, and set like guest um, industry briefs and then crit them. And I think one of the things that people always do is they come and they show me all their research and they show me all of the kind of stuff they've done behind the scenes and I'm like I'm glad you've done that but what I'm interested in is, is your thinking and your, your idea so 
Yeah, um, that's a controversial one. I'm sure you could ask someone else and they'd want to see a process, but for me, the process should be inherent with, with your solution. And you could talk me through your process by all means, but I don't need it kind of, I don't need to see 20 pages of research and all of the insight to know that that's, that's in there. So for me, I'm about the kind of end result and the final idea, but you know, it's controversial. I know different people like different things. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure um, students are always asking me to ask about work experience. Is that something you offer? And, and you did mention earlier that you use a lot of freelancers. So how would, how would you find your freelancers and how would they approach you? Yeah, so in terms of work experience um, with some, you know, someone from university coming in, um, we, well, at, my career started by a year's work experience. So I really believe in that process that if you can get young people into industry and they can see their skills and where they fit and understand how it works and so I'm all for that really so we have um taken on like a year work placement in the past and then we've employed that person afterwards so that's definitely something we ask we haven't got a work placement in at the moment because we're not really sure what they get from kind of sitting on zoom <laughs> with us a lot all day but I think once we get back into the studio definitely kind of work experience is a good thing and um, freelancers um where do we find them instagram word of mouth people contacting us all sorts of places but often when we use a freelancer we've got a very specific skill that we're missing that we're looking for so we often go and seek them out in a way so if we want a specific like illustrative illustrative style we'll seek seek them out as well but I think that's if you are going down the freelance route that visibility being out there networking making connections is vital because that's that's how you'll get your name yeah. dropped in. I know as you mentioned um, Instagram which of course is a very visual um, platform so do you actually keep your eye open for things if you see if you see something that you think is amazing you'll contact that person directly yeah, yeah definitely um one of i'd mentioned we're using um an illustrator at the moment who's improved that came from just spotting his work on instagram and we really liked his work we kind of sold it into the client and then then we started researching where he lived and all of this and then but um, the client was really kind of happy with his work so we had to get a Spanish translator involved and everything but that just came from us finding him on Instagram really loving his work forgetting um, where he lived we sold it in and then then they loved it so yeah Instagram Instagram definitely works but he had a very distinctive style and I think that's that's where Instagram kicks in because there's a lot of the same stuff out there and so that that mm. that's an issue I think you need to sort of find your kind of thing that you can stand out for no I'm glad I'm glad you said that because I'm always going on to the students about how important an online presence is and you've just backed you've yeah. just backed that up <laughs> um right you say 17 years 17 years you've been doing this yeah since um probably 18 I can't yeah. remember it. so um I mean, okay, early part of this century. Um, I love saying century. I know, I feel sick, thanks. I know. Um, obviously, you were, you were already using uh, computers and, 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 and certain aspects of digital technology, but technology must have changed so much in those 18 years. Yeah. Um, how, I mean, has that made things easier? Has it, like, like other industries, democratised the whole design process? Yeah, I mean... I really will show me a job but when I first started in that work placement I hadn't really used Google before you know or mm. you know it was just when the internet was really it was dial up and things like that so you know that's that's how long we're going back now and it's changed hugely like technology has changed hugely I'm not great with technology I can get by um but it's not been my skill but I think everything's changed but nothing's changed the process is still the same so it's just different tools that you use and you must obviously try and keep up to date you don't want to get left behind but I wouldn't be consumed or kind of feel like oh there's a new tool I need to learn everything it's the help of cost though does technology make things um easier to achieve for less money um 
Yes, I guess I guess so. But there's a there's a challenge with technology, like you said. You know, everybody can use it now, so it's very difficult when everyone when anyone could really go on and create their own logo to to mm. keep that value of what you're doing and what you kind of sell in really so there's pros and cons to everything but I think it's it gets harder to sell what you're doing if everybody can do it yeah. but I think that's it's down to you to show kind of the value that you bring that we aren't just someone that's going on a computer and doing a doodle I, kind of thing yeah I think I think technology has done that to all the creative sectors to be honest you've just got to try a bit harder uh, well, well well let's just wrap up with a few quick fire questions yeah. Uh, Daniel Birchall would like to know how long it took you to find your voice design wise. Um, that's something I've probably personally struggled with quite a lot in my earlier career as well. So um, in terms of voice, as in, you know, speaking out and things like that, um, I'm quite, I was, was quite a shy person. So I would always kind of be the one that would be sat around the table with lots of ideas in my notebook and struggling to share those with people. So I'd, I'd be sat there and I'd be really excited with this idea. And then I would just kind of, the nerves would get the better and I wouldn't probably share that. So that's something that I've had to overcome and push myself to do and realize, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm not the best talker or anything, you know, just share your ideas, get them out there. So that did take me, a while and um I would say I wish I'd done that sooner because it did hold me back quite a lot in my earlier career I, you know I, but you know you live and learn so yeah it did take me quite a while okay. it's not something that I particularly feel that comfortable with anyway but I just like I said you get used to being uncomfortable um career highlight um career highlight and there's been so many um you know I, I I'm a designer so I, I kind of love having ideas and then when they're recognized as kind of good ideas so awards and things like that are always kind of career highlights which you know probably isn't something to admit but everyone loves winning awards so I kind of won some kind of decent design awards in my time so definitely those and I think to be honest career highlights you know setting up my own business is, you know, that's a big one, but that kind of the first few months of that was really, really terrifying and exciting. And, you know, we, we'd been working within other agencies, but, you know, there's nothing like, you know, setting up on your own and, oh. you know, everything you do is just down to you. So that was like terrifying, scary, really fun. And yeah, that was definitely the career highlight so far. On that topic, Suzanne Neal has just said, did you have a client base already before you set up Edit? And uh, were you self-financed or did you get funding? No, so um, I guess the lucky thing in the kind of design that I do and is it doesn't take a lot to set up. You need your computer and your brain. And so the setup costs are, are really small. Myself and Khadija, um, we decided, you know, we were going to do our own thing, but I think we thought it'd be more like us two freelancing at first. So we didn't put a lot of pressure on ourselves to like, you know, do this big launch or say we were going to set up. So we kind of did it on our own terms. Um, I had, I didn't have any clients when I left my agency but very quickly we built up the one client and um, that was referenced earlier AJ Bell and that's been our one consistent client we work with them every week um and that's yeah that has really really helped us actually as an, a company to have that kind of one consistent client all the time that we really look after and it's why they've stayed with us um, hopefully okay well time, time to get on so one last question dream client who would be your dream client um, I, I hate this question because I, I just wish I had. That's why I asked it. Everyone hates <laughs> that question. Um, yeah, I think we do have a lot of really good clients already. So you know, good answer. They get big art, big art galleries, and things like that because I'm really interested in art and design. And I think so. We, we're getting there. It would be really good to get some international clients and things that have, you know, maybe some bigger budgets. Not not necessarily to 
I mean for us to make more money I mean to do bigger and better things we have lots of ideas and sometimes you know the budget isn't there to deliver it so it'd be the kind of you know the Silicon Valley tech companies that do have those kind of bigger kind of budgets and things that, that you could be unrestrained in your mm -hmm. ideas and production and things like that but um yeah yeah watch this space <laughs> well listen and, and probably you get lots of good free stuff as well wouldn't you um yeah, yeah. anyway listen karen thank you so much for joining us for this creative future session lots of great tips and advice and a great story too and uh thanks for joining us and good luck for the future yeah no thanks graham thanks everyone